From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Carlson, Johnny, Star Mutual. Oh, hiya, Pete. How's the family? Great. The lucky dogs are at Cape Cod for the summer while I toil and fret. What's fretting you at the moment? A letter, Johnny. Listen. If you're wanting to know who murdered Ellen Bates, you pay no mind to that person or persons unknown. You just look real close to home. Look real close to home. The postmark, Shady Lane, Vermont. And the signature, I suppose, is that famous old name. That's right. Anonymous. Ellen Bates was killed there a month ago, shot to death. We carried a $10,000 policy on her. And the beneficiary? Ben Bates, her husband. He's got a farm about four miles out of Shady Lane. Uh Uh-huh. What's the status of the investigation? Stay on me, Johnny. The coroner's jury brought in an open verdict, and there's been nothing turned up since. We were just on the point of paying off the policy. But now, well... All right, Pete, I'll fret for you. If I can find Shady Lane on the map. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shady Lane matter. Item one, $36.70. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Shady Lane, a quiet little town of around a 1,000 population. Drowsy streets lined with white frame homes, picket fences, and flower-bedded yards. A town with a well-chosen name, built under the protecting shade of venerable elms and spreading maples. A country crossroads town with one of everything. One inn, one restaurant, one garage, one general store, one barber shop, and one constable, a gaunt and lantern-jawed leather-faced man of middle age named Jed Bramler. Yeah, it's a fact, Mr. Dollar. Lived here all my life. First time I've ever seen it this hot. Yeah, it's warm, all right. Mm, for this time of year, at least. Weather's changing. World, too. Everything's changing. <laughs> Except human nature. Mm, that, too, maybe. Take this killing. Don't rightly know how to go about dealing with it. Well, maybe we can figure out something between us. This the bullet that killed him? Yeah, that's the one. Hmm. It's an odd size and shape. Hand poured. Say it's hand poured. It's for an old fashioned squirrel rifle. Smooth bore, single shot. I see. And I reckon that's about all I can give you in the way of facts, or clues, I guess you call them. Oh, well, facts will do. All right. Ellen Bates was a fine woman, had a hard life. She was married, no children, she was alive. Now she's dead. Cause of death, a bullet in the heart. Them's all facts, Mr. Dollar. Mm-hmm. How did it happen? Don't rightly know. Want no witnesses. Could have been an accident, even. What do you mean, an accident? Well, one of them hunters from the city, them through here regular, confounded idiots, shoot at anything that moves. Well, surely not at a human being sitting in her own living room. They might have. Never can tell, crazy as they are. Shot a goat, belonged to Het Wilmer last fall. Caught him with it, tied on their bumper. Said it was a mountain sheep. Yes, but... Yes, they... might have done it unintentional. Then got scared and run out. Yes, possibly. Except for one of those facts. Which fact? This bullet. Hunters from the city don't use old-fashioned squirrel rifles, Mr. Bramler. Mm-hmm. Well, I said it could have been accidental. Didn't say it was, though. I, uh... I reckon somebody meant to kill her. Oh, I don't think there's much doubt of that. There ain't. Wish there was. Might not feel so danged worthless then. What do you mean? Ellen Bates was a fine woman. Hate to think of somebody killing her and getting clean away with it. Then let's make sure they don't get away with it. Got nothing to go on, Mr. Dollar. Not one lonesome thing. What about a possible motive? Haven't turned up a single one. Did she have any enemies? Everybody that knew her loved her. Uh Uh-huh. What about this bullet? Did you have a ballistics check made? Yeah. Send it clear to New York. They come up with anything? Six-page report. Yes, got it here somewhere. You can look at it if you want to. No, no, no need to. Uh, What was their conclusion? Same as mine. Fired from an old-fashioned squirrel rifle. Uh Uh-huh. Know anybody around here who might own a gun like that? Yeah. But near anybody in the township. Must be three, four hundred of them rifles around. Keepsakes. Handed down. Family souvenirs. Yeah. And that's one dead end. Couldn't be much deader. 
It's like I told you. Ain't no clues at all. At least none to speak of. Woman without an enemy in the world. Sitting in front of her window. Shot fired from outside the house. Woman's dead. Them's the facts. And all the facts. No. Not quite all. Eh? What do you mean? People. Persons are facts, you know. And their relations with other persons are facts. Facts that we can check on. Already told you, Mr. Dollar, Ellen Bates didn't have no enemies. The person who killed her wasn't exactly a friend. Known enemies, I mean. But she had contacts and relations with other persons, and one of them, known or unknown, was her enemy. Maybe an accidental enemy with a motive in the capacity for murder. What do you mean by accidental? Maybe Mrs. Bates saw something from that window of hers. Something that made her dangerous to someone else. Maybe she didn't even know she'd made an enemy. Yeah, might be. Or maybe it's just a matter of her death benefiting somebody. Somebody who otherwise wouldn't be her enemy. Mm Mm-hmm. It thought of that, of course. But it don't lead nowhere. It might. I've got a letter here, Mr. Brandler. I wish you'd take a look at it. All right. It arrived yesterday at the home office of my client in Hartford. Mm -hmm. It was mailed here in Shady Lane. I told you. Close to home. Looks real close to home. (laughs) Not signed, eh? No, not signed. Any idea who might have sent it? Yeah, somebody with a lot of vinegar in their blood. No, don't know. It's a fact. Wouldn't count too much on it if I was you. What do you mean? Well, like you just said, a matter of her death benefiting somebody. So? With that insurance policy like it is, the person that would benefit most would be her husband, Ben Bates. Forget him. Why? Like you said, motive and capacity. Even if money was motive enough for Ben, he just hasn't got the capacity for murder. Forget him. Is Ben Bates a good friend of yours, Mr. Bramler? Since we were boys together. I see. Mm -hmm. Maybe you only think you see. I ain't making allowances for him. Just know him, that's all. Maybe I'd better meet him. All right. (coughs) Farm's just out of town a ways. I'll drive you out there if you want. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Only one thing, though. uh, You've got an expense account of some kind, ain't you? Sure, that's right. Why? Well, we're not exactly poor folks up here, but we ain't rich neither. And the township is kind of frugal with their money. I see. Going to have to charge you for the car expense if it's uh, all right with you. Oh, sure. That sounds fine. Yeah, well then. Uh, Maybe we could make a couple of other calls on the way. Who do you want to see? Well, mostly I'd like to talk to the coroner here and... You, uh, you already have. Huh? Yeah. I'm the coroner, Mr. Dollar. Well, are we ready? Expense account item two, three dollars even. Transportation and Constable Jed Bramler's car from Shady Lane to the Ben Bates farm. It was a pleasant trip. Summertime, and a country road winding among the farms, climbing lazily over the ridges. The heady, pungent scent of flax and clover, the hum of bees. But I couldn't completely enjoy it. I kept wondering how much real help I could expect from a constable who'd already made up his mind that the top suspect wasn't capable of murder. A constable who was also coroner. And for all I knew, county attorney and district judge. A constable who might even be... Just an idle thought. Might even be a murderer. Now, this is the Preeny Farm. Ben Bates' place is the next one. About a quarter of a mile. I see. That's uh, Martin Preeny there at the side of the road working on that fence. Might as well pass the time of day with him, I reckon. Were the Preenies and the Bates good friends? Yeah. Real close. Afternoon, Jed. Martin. Township must be getting lax. Letting you go gallivanting around on pleasure trips. Being paid for, Martin. Official business. This here's uh, Mr. Donnie Dollar from down around Hartford. Martin Preeny, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Preeny. I do. That's quite a job you're doing there, Mr. Preeny. Well, a rock wall does just fine if you stack them real careful so they lock together. Looks pretty difficult. Yeah, it takes a knack, no doubt about that. And work and time. But if it's dug in below the frost line, rock wall will last a lifetime. And uh, that's what I believe in, Mr. Dollar. Planning ahead and building right. That's a good philosophy. Uh, and then, too, a rock wall is a sight cheaper than fencing. And right there is his real reason, Mr. Dollar. A man that wastes his substance is a fool and a sinner. And I believe in prudence. It's your only virtue, Martin. Fiddlesticks. We got callers, Sarah. Come on out here. No, ain't staying, Martin. Just passing. Just a minute, Martin. Just, uh, what so-called official business you're on, Jed? 
Murder of Ellen Bates. Mr. Dollar here is an insurance investigator. He's come to look into it. I see. Well, it's a terrible tragedy, Mr. Dollar. Sad thing for the whole township, especially for Sarah and me. Yes, I imagine so. Yeah, they've been good neighbors. Fine people. Folks about to be proud to know. So I understand. Couldn't help feeling sorry for him. Just didn't seem to get ahead in spite of Ben being a good hard worker and all. And then this, on top of all the other trouble he'd had. Well, what do you mean by trouble? Afternoon, gentlemen. Come here, Sarah. I want you to meet a friend of Jed's, Mr. Johnny Dollar, my wife, Sarah. Mrs. Hi, Benny. Mr. Dollar comes from Hartford. Hartford? Then he's here for... He works for an insurance company. He's given Jed the hand with this Ellen Bates thing. Oh, yes, I... I see. Well, don't let me interrupt. I, uh, I just tell him, Mr. Dollar, what good neighbors the Bates have always been. A body couldn't ask for a better friend than Ellen Bates. Mr. Preeny, you said something about all the other trouble they'd had. I was referring to Ellen's illness. Why, well, after that operation last year, she was put in an invalid, you might say. Yeah, ben had to wait on her hand and foot. Long with doing for the house and running the farm. Huh, a lot of time he spent taking care of her. Now, Sarah... Not half as much time as he spent hanging around that girl. What girl is that, Mrs. Preeny? Why, that little flippity jibber that works at... Sarah! Her. I'm sorry, Martin, but it's true and you know it. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid my wife is just repeating gossip she's heard. Ben Bates is a fine young man. Any story to the contrary, idle rumors, nothing more. Well, sometimes the best way to stop an idle rumor is to check into it. If you'd care to tell me who she I is. I know the girl, Mr. Dollar. Her name is Millie Wells. She's a waitress at the Shady Lane Cafe. I'd like to talk to her. You can when we get back to town. Well, folks, reckon we'd better be getting on. Hey, Mr. Dollar, Ellen Bates was a fine woman. Whoever it was killed her, I hope you get him. I believe we will. Oh, and by the way, Mrs. Freeney, the company was very grateful for your letter. My letter? I mean, how did you know it I was... didn't know. I was just guessing. Oh. Nice to have met both of you. See you again. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, of two who are not even accused... One confesses and one denies, and both very strangely. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Thanks, operator. Go ahead, Hartford. Hello? 
Johnny? Yeah, Pete. A big, fat expense account, and you still reverse the call. Had to. I'm phoning from a crossroads store. Look, I need a quick fact or two in connection with the Ellen Bates murder. That $10,000 policy on Ellen's life, when was it written, Pete? Oh, around four years ago. I'll get the exact date if you want to hang on. No, no, that's close enough. I was hoping it was only a year or two back. Knocks a pet theory in the head, huh? No, but it doesn't help it any. Hey, is there also a policy on the life of Ben Bates? Yeah, same amount, taken out at the same time, right after they were married. Add up to anything? A nice round zero. What do the local authorities think? The only local authority in Shady Lane is sitting outside in the car right now, and he thinks the same as I do. Which is what? We're both stumped. I'll be talking to you. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Shady Lane, Vermont, to the Home Office Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Shady Lane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item four, seven cents, a copy of the Shady Lane Weekly Crier, the paper that prints the folksy news, according to the masthead. Maybe it would help, because the whole case seemed to have a folksy flavor. A young farm wife named Ellen Bates, a semi-invalid without a known enemy in the township, had been shot to death a month before. The killer, unidentified. Motive, unknown. Physical evidence, non-existent. Leads, none. I rejoined Constable Jed Bramler in the car and glanced over the paper as we drove on to the Bates farm. I'd begun to realize that, folksy or not, the Bates case was probably going to be tougher than an old boot. Now, we'll, uh, we'll leave the car here at the road and walk up through the draw. I'll show you how it happened. All right, good. This sure doesn't look like very good farmland. Oh, uh, oh, uh, can't. Ben's got a few good acres north of the house, but most of it's like this. Won't grow much of anything except in rocks. Takes a lot of scratching to make a go of a place like this. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. And it would be even tougher if you had to take care of an invalid wife at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I reckon it would. Uh, watch yourself on that barbed wire, Mr. Dollar. All right. Uh, there's easier ways of getting to the house, but I figured you'd like to see how the killer got away. And this is it, you think, huh? He fired the shot from cover and then... Oh, she did. All right, whichever. And then he or she ran back down this draw here and got away. Yeah, must have been seen otherwise. But here in the draw, a person would be out of sight from both houses. Either the Bates place or the Preenies over on the other side. I'll buy that one, all right. This brush is thick enough to hide a herd of cattle. Yeah. Well, once the killer got to the road, back where we left the car, might have gone any place. Yeah, that's the trouble. This case is too full of mites. Tried to pick up a trail in here. Even brought in dogs. But they didn't turn up nothing. Dogs is mostly overrated anyhow. Yeah, so I've heard... Yeah, let's see now. Ought to be right about here some... Ah, ah, yes, there we are. Over that way. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I see the stake you put up to mark the place. Nope, doesn't me to put it up. It's a survey marker. But it's just about where I calculate the shot was fired from. Uh, right about here. What was the survey for, Mr. Bramler? Highway department. They was figuring to build a new turnpike through here last year. Fell through, though. How come? Uh, the whys of a public bureau ain't for mere man to know, Mr. Dollar. They finally picked someplace else a few months ago. Shame, too. Might have made this land worth something to Ben. Another one of those mites, huh? Now, uh, look through the bushes there, just to the left of that big maple. Mm-hmm. That's the corner, the parlor corner of the Bates house. And Ellen was sitting right there in that big front window when it happened. Ben has put the glass back in since. Mm. Well, it wouldn't have been too difficult a shot from here. Mm. Them old-fashioned squirrel rifles is mighty accurate. And nearly everybody in the township has one. That's about it. Now, it's not a matter of finding a needle in a straw stack. It's finding one special straw in a straw stack. Mighty hard chore, I'd say. <laughs> so would I. So there she sat, an easy target, alone at her own front window. Well, not exactly alone, Mr. Dollar. 
Oh? Alone at the window, yes. But Mrs. Preeny was in the room with her at the time. The woman who wrote the anonymous letter accusing Ben Bates? I didn't know that. Yeah, didn't seem to have no bearing. She just happened to be there. Brought over a cake or something from next door. She was always doing things like that for Ellen. Uh-huh. But Mrs. Preeny didn't see who fired the shot. She just heard the window glass crash and saw Ellen come half out of her chair and then fall on the floor. An invalid, helpless, sitting there at a window. Now, what the devil could a woman like that do to make somebody hate her enough to kill her? Mr. Dollar, if I could answer that, I would have somebody locked up by now. If anybody did hate her, of course. Meaning? Maybe hate wasn't the reason. Got a better one? Oh, I'm just supposing. Eh, done quite a bit of that myself. Hey, tell me something, Mr. Bramler. Uh, this waitress at the Shady Lane Cafe, the one Mrs. Preeny made the insinuations about. Millie Wells? Yeah, Millie Wells. Is she pretty? Well, hard to say. Tastes differ. I reckon, though, most anybody'd call her pretty, though. Well, what about that gossip Mrs. Preeny was spouting? Is it just a rumor? Or was Ben seeing Millie before his wife was murdered? Hard not to see her. Ain't a very big town. You know what I mean. Did he go out of his way to see her? Oh, stopped in the cafe there once in a while. Cup of coffee, piece of pie. Doing all the cooking at home like he was. He got a mite tired of it, I reckon. Well, what about now? Is he still seeing her? Eats most of his evening meals there. Is that all it amounts to? Well, folks generally agree that there's some interest building up since his wife's death. Well, what about his wife? Did she have any chance at all of getting well? Nope. Not according to the doctors. I see. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? You are barking up that same wrong tree again. Oh, it kind of adds up. Figures lie sometimes. Pretty girl, young and alive, interested maybe. An invalid wife, run down farm, a $10,000 insurance policy. All facts, true enough. He wouldn't be the first man who went wrong with a setup like that. Ah, uh, not then. I told you before, murder just ain't in his nature. Oh, come on. Let's walk on up to the house and talk to him. Wait a minute, one other thing. That anonymous letter Mrs. Preeny sent us. Now, why would she go out of her way to get Ben Bates in trouble? Hard to say. I thought she was a friend of the Bates. Of Mrs. Bates, yes. Ellen. But for some reason, she never has seemed to like Ben very much. I don't know why she done it, Mr. Dollar. But I sure wouldn't put no stock in what she said. It's just her nature. That's all it is. It was late afternoon. Long shadows were beginning to stretch out over the flinty ground. Almost the same time of day that Ellen Bates was killed. Killed by her husband, I was beginning to believe. And yet Constable Jed Bramler swore by Ben, his longtime friend. Human ties, human emotions, just plain folks. And a case that was growing messier and more vague by the hour. Not much sign of life. Well, Ben's in and out. You never know. Sounds like somebody coming around the house. Mm -hmm. Must have been working out in the barn. Always plenty to do on a Flint Rock farm. You come looking for me, Constable. Ah, how are you, Grody? He said, how are you? I'm fine. I'm just fine. Been around? I I've been working out back, fixing to spread it. Well, that's fine, Grody. Is Ben here? Ben? No. No, Mr. Ben's not here. Know where he is? No, he's not here. Any idea when he'll be back? No. No, he didn't say. You can go in and set, though, if you want, Constable. Maybe we will. Grody, this is Mr. Dollar. Grody Hawkins. How are you, Grody? Oh, I, I'm fine. I'm just fine. Grody does odd jobs for Ben. Some of the other farmers, too. Oh, I see. Were you working here the day Mrs. Bates was killed? Uh, that's a liar. I wasn't even near here that day. And anybody that says I was is a liar. Oh? I, I was crew over on the other side of town. We'll uh, go inside and wait, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, all right. See you, Grody. Kind of gets excited when he figures he's being accused of something. Yeah. He seems scared of you. Has he been in trouble before? Well, petty stuff, like shooting game out of season. Is he a good shot? Dead shot. Never misses. Fact. 
We waited in the parlor for a while, the room where Ellen Bates had died. Her picture was still over the mantel, a clear-eyed sober woman, much younger than I'd imagined. The sun gradually set and the light on the picture grew dim, but Ben didn't come back. We gave up finally and drove back to town. I left Brambler at his office and walked down the street to the Shady Lane Cafe to eat dinner. I'll be right with you, sir. No hurry. It'll be cooler if you sit there by the window. Oh, oh, fine. Thanks. <laughs> there were a half a dozen tables in the place, all empty. I was the only customer. The girl was pretty and friendly and fitted the description of Millie Wells. The pot roast is awfully good this evening. I think you'll like it. All right. You've made a sale. You're a stranger in town, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm investigating the murder of Ellen Bates. I see. Are you by any chance Millie Wells? Yes. Then I guess you're the person I'm looking for. You worked very fast. I thought it would take longer. Hmm? Oh, I knew you'd find out, of course, sooner or later, but, but I was hoping Ben and I would have a little time together first. I see. We were fools to expect it, though. <laughs> Once you've been tagged, you don't have a chance. Did Ellen Bates have a chance? I didn't give her the slightest cause to worry. I didn't let Ben know once how I felt. Not until after she'd been killed. That was very considerate of you. And I know he didn't give me one thought as long as she was alive. It's not in his nature. So I've heard. It, doesn't it mean anything at all when a person has been acquitted? Acquitted? Acquitted of what? Of murder. What else? Isn't that what... Oh, I thought you knew. I thought that's what you... I guess maybe you'd better tell me about it, Millie. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a sudden twist and a cool threat. A strange revelation. And the lies come thick and fast. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dawn. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Well, this is Jet Bramler. Oh, hiya, Constable. Reckon I got the wrong number. I was calling Shady Lane Cafe. Now, you've got it. I'm sitting right here at the counter. Yes, well, but uh, where's Millie, Mr. Dollar? She's busy crying at the moment. 
I'm waiting for her to get through and hoping she'll confess to murder. No, you hadn't ought to gone and made her cry that way. Millie is a fine girl. That's the trouble with this whole case, according to you. Everybody in this township is fine people, all of them. Ellen Bates was a fine woman, too, and now she's dead. And one of these fine people killed her. No, I'm no. going to find out which one, Mr. Bramler, and I'm going to tag him for it. With your help or without it. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Shady Lane, Vermont, to the Home Office, Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Shady Lane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 7, $1.40, one pot roast special at the Shady Lane Cafe, while waitress Millie Wells dried her tears and repaired her face. I thought over what she'd said, what I'd taken for a confession, and tried to fit it in with the other facts in the case. What few facts there were. A young farm wife, a semi-invalid named Ellen Bates, had been shot to death while sitting at the front window of her house. The weapon was an old-fashioned squirrel rifle, a type of gun owned by half the people in the township. Ellen Bates had no known enemies. Her husband, beneficiary of a $10,000 insurance policy on his wife's life, had been accused by a spiteful neighbor of carrying on with pretty waitress Millie Wells. It's a lie, Mr. Dollar. Anyone who says Ben and I were seeing each other or even thought of such a thing before his wife's death is a mean, vicious liar. All right, take it easy now, take it easy. There's no point in getting yourself all worked up and starting to cry again. Ben's a fine man, straight and decent. And it makes me boil to have some low, sneaking gossip try to smear his reputation without reason. It reflects on your reputation a little too, Millie. I don't care about me. I told you what I've been through. I'm used to it. Do you ever get used to something like that? No. No, not really. A murder charge isn't an easy thing to forget. You dream about it nights. The prison, the courtroom, the trial. The things they said about you. But you were acquitted, finally. I was acquitted. And I was innocent. But just being tried for murder brands a person for life. What were the details of the case? First, let me tell you about Ben. You haven't met him yet, Mr. Dollar. You, you don't know him. And I know the line you're thinking along. It's the way things point, Millie. Then things point wrong, that's all. Maybe. Go on. Well, he's been coming in here for the last six months. Not often, just... Just every once in a while, just to eat. Does Ben know you stood trial on a murder charge? He does now. He didn't before, before his wife was killed. We just made conversation, that's all. And since her death? There's been no carrying on, as some people choose to think. One day, Ben said, Millie, when, when this mess is all settled, I'd like very much to see more of you. That's all. That's all. And that's enough. Because I love him. About the trial, Millie. It was four years ago, in Chicago. I was working for a family on the west side as a nursemaid, governess. They were wonderful. Well, what happened? The wife died suddenly, under strange circumstances. It could have been an accident, or it might have been poison. I thought you already knew about it. That's why I blurted it out that way. Oh, I'd have found out anyway, sooner or later. Yes, I know. It was in all the headlines. The same things that they'll be saying about me here. What do you mean? I was accused of murdering the wife because I was in love with the husband. I left the Shady Lane Cafe and the tortured girl whose secret, close hidden for four frightened years, was now the property of a stranger. It was late now, and the town square was dark and deserted. A stark white moon was climbing the eastern sky, and the soft summer night's breath stirred in the leafy tops of the maples, whispering other secrets, secrets the villagers dared not stay abroad and listen to. A fantasy, sure, pure and simple. Uh, maybe it was a bad slice of pot roast. Anyway, the dim light burning in the office of Constable Jed Bramler brought me back to harsh reality. 
Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in. Pull up the chair. Okay. Thanks. That uh, girl stopped crying yet? Sniffling a little, maybe. But she's practically stopped. For the time being, at least. Mean something by that? You know what I mean by it. Yeah, I reckon you must have found out about her past, so to speak. You knew about it? Yeah, since the day she came to town. Stopped in to see me, told me all about it. Well, you were keeping it pretty quiet, weren't you? It was told in confidence, Mr. Dollar. All right, but this is a murder case. It don't have no bearing. Millie ain't involved. Would you mind if I had a chance to decide that once in a while? Didn't know you'd be interested. Don't you realize that Millie Wells may be the reason for the killing? Still beating a dead horse, eh? I think that horse is coming to life, Mr. Bramler. You do. The way things stand right now, a prosecuting attorney could go into court with a pretty strong case. The charge, first-degree murder. Accused, your friend Ben Bates. You ain't met Ben yet, Mr. Dollar. No, no, I haven't met him, but the facts add up. It's an old, old story. Yeah, it's a downright classic. An invalid wife, a pretty girl, a run-down farm that doesn't look as though it's made a profit in years. A $10,000 life insurance policy dangling like a carrot. Yeah. Fact is, it's even worse a picture if you're mind to look at it that way. Oh. That farm of Ben's ain't only run down, it's mortgaged to the hilt. Oh. Ben needed money for Ellen's operations. She'd had three in the last year and a half. He tried every way he knew how to, but the banks wouldn't touch it. Well, in that case... Martin Preeny, his next-door neighbor, come through and helped him out. $7,500. Is the farm worth that much? Nope. Wouldn't bring 4500 if it was sold tomorrow. That's what I mean. Ben feels pretty obligated. And the $10,000 from that policy on his wife would have taken the pressure off all the way around. Plus, leave him free to marry Millie Wells. All right, all right. I know it adds up that way. I've been studying over this thing for a month now, trying to figure out some other way of explaining it, hoping that somebody would show their hand. Yes, make a move some kind. And nothing's happened, huh? No. Whoever done it is just sitting tight, waiting. Might be a good thing that you come along. Might jar things loose a little. Yeah. Well, whether I'm right or wrong, one thing we've got to jar loose is that gun. That's a fact, all right. Can't make much of a case against nobody without that gun. You said nearly everybody in the township owned one of those old-fashioned squirrel rifles, the type Ellen was killed with. That's right. What about her husband? Does Ben own one? Nope. Nothing but a shotgun. Yes, I saw it when we were out there this afternoon hanging over the mantel. But at the same time, I noticed something else. What do you mean? That shotgun was resting on a pair of hooks set into the bricks above the fireplace. But the hooks hadn't been put there for that particular gun. Now, they were too far apart. What are you getting at, Mr. Dollar? I think those hooks would fit a squirrel rifle just fine. Ben ain't one to lie. He told me he didn't have a rifle. But that's something else I've been studying about. What do you mean? I kind of half remember seeing a squirrel gun hanging over that mantle in years gone by. Expense account item eight, three dollars. Car expense for another trip out to the Bates farm. A late night trip this time and the last one, I hoped. Constable Bramler had suggested that my being in the case might help stir things up. Good, I was all for it. And not just stir things up, but wind them up. Tonight, maybe, if we caught Ben Bates at home. Lights on inside. Yeah, you must be here someplace. Oh, evening, Jed. Ben, like you to meet Mr. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar? Hi, Ben. Hey, you fellas are out late. Little, I reckon. Mind if we come inside, Ben? Oh, sure. Sorry, Judd, I didn't think. Well, let's go on back through to the kitchen. That's about the only room I use since... Well, any more, I mean. Set yourselves down there at the table. I'll get us some lemonade if there's any ice left. Oh, a lemonade lift would suit me fine. Don't go no trouble for us, Ben. No, no trouble at all. Got it already made. Just have to chip a little ice into it. I reckon you'll kind of have to bear with me. I'm not much used to having callers come around since... Ellen. It's all right, Ben. Here we are. Hey, you fellas got some business out this way tonight? Fact is, Ben, we come out here to talk to you. Mr. Dollar is an insurance investigator. He's here to find out who killed Ellen. I see. You got any ideas yet, Mr. Dollar? I've... I've kind of got an idea you might have done it, Ben. I wouldn't have harmed a hair of Ellen's head. I could be wrong. 
Mr. Dollar has been checking around, Ben, talking to people here and there. The Preenies, Millie Wells. What's Millie got to do with it? Nothing, maybe. Or she might be part of the motive. I didn't even make her acquaintance hardly before the last week or two. What about Mrs. Preeny? You've known her longer, haven't you? Yes, she was a good friend of Ellen's. Why? She thinks you killed your wife. She wrote an anonymous letter about it to the insurance company. The woman was crazy. I knew she never liked me for some reason, but I sure wouldn't figure her to go that far. Ben, uh, whatever happened to that squirrel rifle you had around the house? Why, the week before Ellen died, somebody... Yes, Ben? No, I didn't lie to you, Jed, not actually. When I told you I didn't have a rifle like that, I didn't. Not then. And you didn't ask me if I had had one. What happened to the rifle? Well, it was stolen the week before Ellen was killed. I haven't seen it since. Mm-hmm. No, that's the truth, Mr. Dollar. You didn't report it being stolen. Ellen asked me not to. She figured she knew who took it, and she wanted to give them a chance to make good. You know how she was. But after she'd been shot by that same kind of rifle, you still didn't report it. Report afterward that the gun had been took before? <laughs> who might have taken it, then? Well, I've tried to think. It wasn't nobody came here that week except Mrs. Preeny and Grody Hawkins. Grody Hawkins. That's the hired hand we met here this afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know. The one who was a dead shot with a gun. No, no, no. Grody wouldn't kill nobody. He's a little touched, maybe, but he's good-hearted and gentle. Is he another one of your pets, Constable? Don't you care whether the killer is identified? It's kind of a funny question to ask a murder victim's uncle. Uncle? Mr. Bramler... Was Ellen Bates your niece? She was. I didn't think to mention it, Mr. Dollar. Just figured you knew, I guess. And anyhow, it don't have no bearing. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a slow net tightens and the fish turn frantic. And one of them, at least, is armed and dangerous, as deadly as a shark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello? Hello? Hello, hello. Sorry to scare off your caller, Ben. You always answer other people's phones, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, when it's right at my elbow, and when I want to find out who's calling at this time of night. Did you find out? I think so. 
I know of only one person in the township who'd probably hang up when they heard my voice. And uh, who you reckon that'd be, Mr. Dollar? Millie Wells, Jed. Who else? I think you'd better leave Millie out of this if you don't mind. I can understand your concern, Ben, but I'm afraid I can't go along with it. Your wife has been murdered. Gossip around town says you and Millie have been interested in each other. And Millie stood trial four years ago on a charge of murder. Add it up, Ben. Add it up. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Shady Lane, Vermont... To the home office, Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Shady Lane matter. Expense account continued. It was a messy case, hard to move around in. A small community, and everybody in it was a neighbor or friend of everybody else. Except, of course, the unknown person who'd murdered Ellen, Ben Bates' invalid wife. But the ties were close. Ellen, it turned out, was the niece of Constable Jed Bramler. And Sarah Preeny, next-door neighbor, had accused Ben of carrying on with waitress Millie Wells, who was a good friend of Constable Bramler. And Sarah Preeny's husband had helped Ben out of a jam by loaning him $7,500 on a worthless farm. Yeah, it was sticky and tight and uncomfortable. Touch one domino and you moved all of them. But the key to the game, I was still convinced, was Ben Bates himself. Yeah, you're wrong, Mr. Dollar. I've known Ben here for more years than I can't think about. Murder just ain't in his nature. Mr. Bramler, I think you're just too close to this case to keep a perspective on it. I know these people, and you don't. Well, that's exactly the point. Ben is your friend. He was married to your niece, so you just can't imagine him committing a murder. It ain't in his nature. Oh, I've never seen a killer yet without at least a few friends who were certain that murder wasn't in his nature. Now listen to me, both of you. It's not a question of my nature. It's a question of fact, and the fact is a plain and simple one. I didn't kill Ellen, Mr. Dollar. A lot of things say different, Ben. And there's nothing at all between me and Millie. If Ellen had lived, I'd have never spoken to her. As it is, I've only asked her if I could see her sometime, once this thing is all settled. Uh, well, you're together, at least. That's about what she told me. We're together because it's the truth, Mr. Dollar. Or because you've already talked it over. One fault I haven't got is lying. Not even about your rifle being stolen? Oh, well, it wasn't no actual lie. When Jed here asked me if I had a squirrel gun, I said no. And like I told you, I didn't then. It had already been stolen. Suppose he'd asked you if you had a squirrel rifle. Well, I reckon I'd have had to fess up to it. Well, we'll never know, of course, for sure. But one thing is sure. After your wife was shot and killed by a gun of that same type, you still didn't report to the constable here that yours had been taken. Well, I, I, I explained it to you. How would it have looked if I'd have told him after Ellen was shot that my old squirrel gun had been stolen before? And you didn't report the theft when it happened because Ellen asked you not to. Is that the story? She thought she knew who took it. She wanted a chance to get it back without causing them trouble. And of course she's not here now to back you up on that. It's the truth. She was like that. Jed here, I'll tell you. Kind-hearted and tolerant with people. Yeah, she was that all right. It's a fact. If either Mrs. Preeny or Grody Hawkins took it, and they're the only ones that was here that week... Then she was aiming to talk to whichever one it was and get it back without bringing the law in. Only she never had the chance to. She was killed. Yeah. Yeah, and that gun figures in it somehow. It's bound to. Look, we've got to find it, Mr. Bramler. Might take some doing. Then we'd better get at it. Tonight? Tonight. We got things stirred up now. Let's keep them stirred up. No, all right. Ben, you claim you're not guilty of this. It ain't a claim. It's a fact. Then who would you say is the most likely suspect? Ellen didn't have a single enemy in this world, as far as I know. There ain't a person in this township that had a reason to kill her. Except you. For the money, you mean? For that life insurance policy? It's worth $10,000. And I'm that kind, you think? A man who'd murder his own wife just to get his hands on $10,000. Ben, I don't know. But there's one thing you can count on. I'm going to find out. <laughs> Constable Bramler and I left Ben alone in his empty farmhouse, drove back into town. 
The moon was higher now, and the countryside was dappled in black and silver. And it, too, was empty and silent. We alone moved and made noise as we rattled down the winding dirt road through the flint rock valleys between the sleeping elms and maples. Logic still pointed at Ben Bates, but I'd begun to doubt logic a little. Ramler was right. Murder didn't seem to be in Ben's nature. And I wasn't sure now whether he sat there in his silent house alone with guilt or alone with grief. Brody lives back at the feed store there. What do you mean, back of it? Well, kind of a shack there on the back corner of the lot. They let him live in it in return for keeping an eye on the store at night. Yeah, quite a choice for a night watch when a kid who's been up several times for petty theft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I reckon it does seem a bit odd. Well, let's go see if he's there. You know, folks around here use a person according to his nature. Grody is pretty reliable at something he's made responsible for. And why do you think he might have stolen that squirrel rifle from Ben Bates' place? He was working for Ben, wasn't he? Well, uh, but just as a hired hand, he wasn't hired specially not to steal. But here he is. Oh, now, that's a fine point of ethics. Well, yeah, most points of ethics is that way. Reckon Grody just does ornery things sometimes so people will notice him, take an interest in him. He's a little simple-minded, but he ain't a bad kid at heart. Is anybody bad in your book, Mr. Bramler? Whoever killed Ellen Bates is. Watch step now. It's pretty dark back here. Yeah. I hope nobody has dug a hole here someplace. Ain't likely. No, I think the door is here to the corner somewhere. If I recollect rightly. It's been a long time. Watch it. You all right? Yes. Bruised machines all. Now, who in the Sam Hill put all these boxes in front of the door here? You stop right there now. Don't you move. He's got a rifle on us. All right, don't try nothing, Mr. Dollar. Like I told you, he's a dead shot. What you whispering about there? Uh, never you mind, Grody. You just put that gun down. I'll put it up. Don't you move now. Let me get my flashlight. It's Jed, Grody. Constable Bramler. Mr. Dollar's with me. You stand still till I get a light on you. And then we'll see. That golly tits. Yes, didn't you recognize my voice? Never can tell. People might try something funny. Try to break in. Something like that. Well, now that you know who we are, Grody, how about having a look at that gun you're holding on us? Well, I don't know. I guess if Constable Bramler says it's all right... It's all right, Grody. Let him look at the gun. All right, then. Here. Thanks. Mind holding the flashlight here? All right. Well, at least this isn't the one. It's a twenty-two. What are you fellas up to, anyhow? Grody, what did you do with that squirrel rifle you took from over Ben Bates' mantle? Well, Odie? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't. Anybody says I've done that is lying. Now, now, don't get excited, Grody. We don't want to wake up this whole town while we're walking across there. Where are we going, Constable? Over to the city jail. <laughs> Quiet night. Not even a mockingbird singing out there. I wish that bird back in the cell would do some singing. Yeah, he will. Always gets to bothering him after he's in for a while. Thirty minutes hasn't bothered him much. He'll talk pretty soon. Provided, of course, he has anything to talk about. I know that boy inside out. Now, whether he stole that gun or not, he's lying about something. <laughs> I'm going to have to buy some oil one of these days. Doggone chair even gets on my nerves. <laughs> I don't think anything gets on your nerves, Mr. Bramwell. Well, the country up here has that kind of influence, I reckon. These hills are older than man. They've seen a lot of things come and go. Guess they kind of quiet a person down if he stays here long enough. I doubt if this place is as quiet as it looks. I think there are things under the surface, like flint rocks in a field, and sooner or later they work to the top and break off a plowshare. Yeah, happens sometimes. Isn't there anyone you can think of who might have hated her, even slightly? Miss Dollar, if I was to say honestly who I thought was the best-liked person in this whole township, I would have to name my niece, Ellen Bates. And yet somebody put a bullet through her head and fired at her from the brush without even any warning. It's a fact. There had to be a lot of hate behind that bullet. Or a lot of greed. <laughs> Same old tune, eh? 
Ben killed her for the insurance. I keep coming back to it because nothing else makes any sense. And neither does that. He owed that mortgage to Martin Prini, and the farm wasn't worth it. Martin wasn't pressing him for it. Maybe not. But if I tag Ben right, he still felt the obligation, the sense of pressure. $10,000 must have looked pretty big to him. Not that big, Mr. Dollar. Then there's Millie Wells, pretty as a picture and in love with him. And an invalid wife at home. Constable? Well, our pigeon's starting to chirp. Mm Mm-hmm. Let him think I ain't coming right away. He gets more anxious. Saves time in the long run. Matter of understanding his nature, huh? Something like that. Constable Brandler? What about your nature, Mr. Brandler? Always was kind to my mother. And your niece, too? Meaning? How did you and Ellen get along? Fine. Just fine. Constable! Hmm. Reckon he must be ready to talk now. It's true. I was lying about it. I stole that gun, all right. But I ain't got it now. Where is it, Brody? I sold it to Mr. Martin Preeny to hang in his house. Martin Preeny? Yeah, can't figure Martin paying money for something to hang in the house. He's too tight-fisted. He gave me $4 for it about three weeks ago. That would be after Ellen was shot. And you took the gun the week before the murder. Are you, are you saying that I shot Miss Bates? That gun was in your possession at the time, Grody. Oh, she was the best friend I ever had. The only one in this town that ever treated me like somebody. I wouldn't have done nothing to hurt Miss Bates. You had that gun, the same kind she was killed with. Oh, that gun ain't been fired in years. What? Well, Mr. Bates never did use it. Why, well, it's even got rust inside the barrel. Grody, for your sake, I hope it has. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, one domino tips, the whole stack tumbles. And the last man falls with a crash. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. I do hope I didn't wake you up. I was already up, Mrs. Preeny. Mrs. Pre... Well, how did you know? I recognized your voice. What can I do for you? Well, I... I know you'll think me terribly forward, but... I have to see you, Mr. Dollar. Right away. All right, I'm in room 22. Come on up. Oh, all, you're a man, and I'm... And you're a woman. 
Mrs. Preeny, I'm sure you haven't come into town this morning to play footsie. So let's both relax and forget about the fact that... This is a small town, Mr. Dollar, and you know how people talk here. Yeah, I know. And what are they talking about this morning? Well, the murder, I suppose. And, Mr. Dollar, I've got to see you right away. I've done a horrible thing, and I'm ready to confess. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Shady Lane, Vermont... To the home office, Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Shady Lane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 10, 55 cents. A cup of coffee for myself and a pot of tea for Mrs. Sarah Preeny. She considered the hotel lunchroom an innocent enough place, and I met her there five minutes after she phoned my room. It was Mrs. Preeny who brought me into the case by writing the anonymous letter to the insurance company. Ellen Bates, a farm wife with no known enemies, had been shot to death. Mrs. Preeny, her best friend, had implied in the letter that Ellen's own husband, Ben, was guilty. And I was inclined to agree with her. Ben was the beneficiary of Ellen's $10,000 life insurance policy. There seemed to be no other motive, unless Mrs. Preeny was about to confess one. She didn't do it, Mr. Dollar. Who didn't do what? That girl. She didn't warm the teapot. For two cents, I'd send it back and make her do it right. Well, I'm a little pressed for time, Mrs. Freeman. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to do it, really. I just said that. I, I wouldn't want to attract attention under the circumstances. You mean the fact that I'm a man and you're a woman, and apparently the twain had an ought to be meeting in Shady Lane, at least. Well, people will talk, you know. And I didn't want Martin to know. Why not? Well, then he'd want to know why. Of course... I'd have to tell him, and, well... Well, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Preeny, I'd kind of like to know why. Well, it's... Oh, this isn't easy for me to say, you know. Well, let's have a try at it anyway. It's about that letter that I wrote to the insurance company that I didn't sign my name to. Yes? It was a terrible thing to do. Just terrible. In what way? Why, those things I said about Ben. Mr. Bates, I mean insinuating he might have had something to do with Ellen's death, her murder, I mean. You made some fairly definite statements, Mrs. Preeny. They weren't true, Mr. Dollar. But I'm telling you the truth now. I know Ben didn't have anything to do with Ellen's death. Mrs. Preeny, there were some other things you implied to me, too, you know. Yes, about him and Aunt Millie Wells that works at the Shady Lane Cafe. I said they were carrying on before Ellen was killed. I made that up just to hit out at him. Why? I don't know, really. Ellen was wonderful, and I just loved her. But sometimes I'd get to thinking that... Not that my Martin isn't a fine man, you understand. Steady, reliable. You know, you've met him. Oh, yes, I'd say your husband is quite steady and reliable. I didn't want you to think that I was saying anything against him. But life on a farm isn't easy for a woman at the best, Mr. Dollar. Sometimes she gets silly notions, I guess. What sort of notions? Oh, a, a woman's human. She wants a little warmth, understanding. That's all. Nothing more. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I think I do. But Ben Bates... Well, he didn't even look at me. Didn't see me. That's all I wanted. Just for him to look at me. But he didn't do it, Mr. Dollar. Not even once. I left her sitting there in the stark bare wooden booth in the lunchroom, sipping her prim cup of cold tea and trying to hide a red-faced confusion behind the shreds of decent dignity. Constable Bramler was right. 
Scratch the surface of Shady Lane anywhere, and you found a human passion just beneath the skin. Good morning, Constable. Yeah, morning, Mr. Dollar. Sleep well? So-so. How's Grody Hawkins? Still asleep, back there in his cell. He admits stealing that squirrel gun from Ben Bates' mantle the week before Ellen was shot. And claims he sold it to Martin Preeny the week after the murder. Yeah, so by his own admission, the gun was in Grody's possession the day of the killing. But Grody claims the gun is rusty and hasn't been fired in years. Yeah, whether it's rusty or not, Grody didn't kill nobody. Have you been out to the Preeny farm yet to pick up the gun? No, figured you might like to do that yourself. You can use my car if you want to. Cost you another three dollars, though. How did you make a living before I came along? It wasn't easy. Traffic tickets, mostly. New turnpike's gonna stop all that, though. Misses the town complete. Along with Ben Bates' farm, huh? Yeah. Too bad they didn't stick to the original survey. Made that place of his worth something, maybe. And it might have saved his wife's life. <laughs> Still beating that dead horse, eh? Oh, Ben Bates was up against the wall. A worthless farm, mortgage for $7,500 to Martin Preeny... A strong sense of moral obligation to pay it off. An invalid wife who would never get well. With a $10,000 policy on her life. Murder ain't in Ben's nature. I told you. Then whose nature is it in? Mrs. Preeny's, maybe? She came to see me at the hotel a little while ago. You don't say so. She wanted to explain why she'd lied about Ben. Uh-huh. Reckon it was because he wouldn't pay no attention to her. Who told you? Hmm. Figured it out. Reckon Martin ain't too easy a man for a woman to live with. Too straight laced, tight fisted. And Ben right next door that way, fine looking young fella. Her running in all the time, taking things to Ellen, bound to want to be noticed. Yeah, it's the nature of a woman. What about Ellen, Mr. Bramler? She was your niece. What was her nature? <sighs> Ain't so easy to figure your own kin, Mr. Dollar. Reckon it was just her nature to be a victim, kind of. <laughs> I drove slowly through the early morning countryside, lush and green, still moist from the night dew and not yet touched by the heat of day. Farm after farm, snug and smug and safe. But Ellen Bates, a woman who never harmed anyone in her life, had lived on such a farm. Yet a bullet had crashed through the window and found her. I'd left the car parked in the yard and walked on up to the porch. The door opened before I had a chance to... Oh! Oh, good morning, Mrs. Brini. You... Surprise me, Mr. Dollar. Is your husband at home? Yes, he's... He's in there working on his accounts. I was just going to take some strawberry preserves to Mrs. Thrasher up the road. She hasn't been feeling too well. Sorry to hear it. You're... You're not going to say anything to Martin about... Well, you know, what about... I wouldn't think of it, Mrs. Preeny. Thank you. I have to take these preserves to Mrs. Thrasher. You just go right on in, Mr. Dollar. Yes, thanks. Mr. Preeny? In here. Come on in. Sorry to bother you this early in the morning. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Just finishing my accounts for the fiscal year. What can I do for you, sir? Well, unless I've been misinformed, you bought an old squirrel gun from Grody Hawkins a while back. That's right. It's hanging there over the fireplace. Quite a bargain. Unless he stole it someplace. As a matter of fact, he did. From your neighbor, Ben Bates. Mm. Then I'm out the price. I'll take it over to Ben this afternoon. Mind if I take a look at the gun, Mr. Preeny? I'm trying to check up on Grody's story. No, no. Go right ahead. I'll just finish this total while you're at it. Then we'll have time for a chat. He went back to the ledges on the table in front of him, and I reached up and took down the rifle, down from its hooks above the mantel. Grody had told the truth. There was rust in the barrel and breech. The gun hadn't been cleaned nor fired in a long time. The hooks over the fireplace were old and rusted, too. They'd been there for years. And suddenly I knew. Find what you were after, Mr. Dollar? I found more than I was after. I found out who killed Ellen Bates. Grody Hawkins? No. No, not Grody. And not Ben Bates. Even though he is named as beneficiary of that $10,000 insurance policy. What do you mean? It was somebody who stood to profit even more than Ben did from that $10,000. Who? Somebody who made a $7,500 loan out of kindness. That alone should have tipped me off, Mr. Preeny. As Jed Bramler says... 
It wasn't in your nature. My nature? But of course it wasn't kindness. At the time, it was good business because a turnpike was planned that would make the farm worth double the loan. But the road fell through and you were stuck with a worthless farm, unless Ben could get money to pay you. I imagine that's when you started thinking about murder. Are you accusing me of murder, Mr. Dollar? Those hooks over the mantel have been there a long time. Where's the rifle that hung there before you bought this one from Grody Hawkins? There might not have been one. The neighbor's will remember. Let me uh, just put down this final total. Yeah. I had a good year last year. Very good year. I doubt it's going to be that good this year. No regrets, Mr. Dollar. It's like farming. You take risks on drought, frost, insects. Sometimes you make a mistake and lose. I knew I'd made a mistake the second I pulled that trigger. After that, it was just a matter of time. The gun is buried out behind the barn. I'll get my hat. Item 12, $94.35. Incidentals in Shady Lane and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $186.60. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, a diamond, a huge one, the star of Cape Town. A piece of ice that should have been kept on ice. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is written by Les Crutchfield and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Forrest Lewis, Shirley Mitchell, Will Wright, Bert Holland, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. where we left the car might have gone any place. Yeah, that's the trouble. This case is too full of mice. Tried to pick up a trail in here. Even brought in dogs. But they didn't turn up nothing. Dogs is mostly overrated anyhow. Yeah, so I've heard. Yeah, let's see now. Ought to be right about here some... Ah, ah yes, there we are. Over that way. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I see the stake you put up to mark the place. Nope, doesn't me to put it up. It's a survey marker. But it's just about where I calculate the shot was fired from. Uh, right about here. What was the survey for, Mr. Bramler? Highway department. They was figuring to build a new turnpike through here last year. Fell through, though. How come? 
Uh, the whys of a public bureau ain't for mere man to know, Mr. Dollar. They finally picked someplace else a few months ago. Shame, too. Might have made this land worth something to Ben. Another one of those mites, huh? Now, uh, look through the bushes there, just to the left of that big maple. Mm-hmm. That's the corner, the parlor corner of the Bates house. And Ellen was sitting right there in that big front window when it happened. Ben has put the glass back in since. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't have been too difficult a shot from here. Mm. Them old-fashioned squirrel rifles is mighty accurate. And nearly everybody in the township has one. That's about it. Now, it's not a matter of finding a needle in a straw stack. It's finding one special straw in a straw stack. Mighty hard chore, I'd say. <laughs> so would I. So there she sat, an easy target, alone at her own front window. Well, not exactly alone, Mr. Dollar. Oh? Alone at the window, yes. But Mrs. Preeny was in the room with her at the time. The woman who wrote the anonymous letter accusing Ben Bates? I didn't know that. Yeah, didn't seem to have no bearing. She just happened to be there, brought over a cake or something from next door. She was always doing things like that for Ellen. Uh-huh. But Mrs. Preeny didn't see who fired the shot. She just heard the window glass crash and saw Ellen come half out of her chair and then fall on the floor. An invalid, helpless, sitting there at a window. Now, what the devil could a woman like that do to make somebody hate her enough to kill her? Mr. Dollar, if I could answer that, I would have somebody locked up by now. If anybody did hate her, of course. Meaning? Maybe hate wasn't the reason. Got a better one? Oh, I'm just supposing. Eh, done quite a bit of that myself. Hey, tell me something, Mr. Bramler. Uh, this waitress at the Shady Lane Cafe, the one Mrs. Preeny made the insinuations about. Millie Wells? Yeah, Millie Wells. Is she pretty? Well, hard to say. Tastes differ. I reckon, though, most anybody'd call her pretty, though. Well, what about that gossip Mrs. Preeny was spouting? Is it just a rumor? Or was Ben seeing Millie before his wife was murdered? Hard not to see her. Ain't a very big town. You know what I mean. Did he go out of his way to see her? Oh, stopped in the cafe there once in a while. Cup of coffee, piece of pie. Doing all the cooking at home like he was. He got a mite tired of it, I reckon. Well, what about now? Is he still seeing her? Eats most of his evening meals there. Is that all it amounts to? Well, folks generally agree that there's some interest building up since his wife's death. Well, what about his wife? Did she have any chance at all of getting well? Nope. Not according to the doctors. I see. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? You are barking up that same wrong tree again. Oh, it kind of adds up. Figures lie sometimes. Pretty girl, young and alive, interested maybe. An invalid wife, run-down farm, a $10,000 insurance policy. All facts, true enough. He wouldn't be the first man who went wrong with a setup like that. Ah, uh, not Ben. I told you before, murder just ain't in his nature. Oh, come on. Let's walk on up to the house and talk to him. Wait a minute, one other thing. That anonymous letter Mrs. Preeny sent us. Now, why would she go out of her way to get Ben Bates in trouble? Hard to say. I thought she was a friend of the Bates. Of Mrs. Bates, yes. Ellen. But for some reason, she never has seemed to like Ben very much. I don't know why she done it, Mr. Dollar. But I sure wouldn't put no stock in what she said. It's just her nature. That's all it is. <laughs> It was late afternoon. Long shadows were beginning to stretch out over the flinty ground. Almost the same time... From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Thanks, operator. Go ahead, Hartford. Hello? Johnny? Yeah, Pete. A big, fat expense account, and you still reversed the call. Had to. I'm phoning from a crossroads store. Look, I need a quick fact or two in connection with the Ellen Bates murder. That $10,000 policy on Ellen's life. When was it written, Pete? Oh, around four years ago. I'll get the exact date if you want to hang on. No, no, that's close enough. I was hoping it was only a year or two back. Knocks a pet theory in the head, huh? No, but it doesn't help it any. Hey, is there also a policy on the life of Ben Bates? Yeah, same amount. Taken out at the same time, right after they were married. Add up to anything? A nice round zero. What do the local authorities think? The only local authority in Shady Lane is sitting outside in the car right now, and he thinks the same as I do. Which is what? We're both stumped. I'll be talking to you. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Shady Lane, Vermont, to the Home Office Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Shady Lane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item four, seven cents, a copy of the Shady Lane Weekly Crier, the paper that prints the folksy news, according to the masthead. Maybe it would help, because the whole case seemed to have a folksy flavor. A young farm wife named Ellen Bates, a semi-invalid without a known enemy in the township, had been shot to death a month before. The killer, unidentified. Motive, unknown. Physical evidence, non-existent. Leads, none. I rejoined Constable Jed Bramler in the car and glanced over the paper as we drove on to the Bates farm. I'd begun to realize that, folksy or not, the Bates case was probably going to be tougher than an old boot. Now, we'll, uh, we'll leave the car here at the road and walk up through the draw. I'll show you how it happened. All right, good. This sure doesn't look like very good farmland. Oh, uh, oh, uh, can't. Ben's got a few good acres north of the house, but most of it's like this. Won't grow much of anything except in rocks. Takes a lot of scratching to make a go of a place like this. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. And it would be even tougher if you had to take care of an invalid wife at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I reckon it would. Uh, watch yourself on that barbed wire, Mr. Dollar. All right. Uh, there's easier ways of getting to the house, but I figured you'd like to see how the killer got away. And this is it, you think, huh? He fired the shot from cover and then... Oh, she did. All right, whichever. And then he or she ran back down this draw here and got away. Yeah, must have been seen otherwise. But here in the draw, a person would be out of sight from both houses. Either the Bates place or the Preenies over on the other side. I'll buy that one, all right. This brush is thick enough to hide a herd of cattle. Yeah. Well, once the killer got to the road... Anything? Six-page report. Yes, got it here somewhere. You can look at it if you want to. No, no, no need to. Uh, What was their conclusion? Same as mine. Fired from an old-fashioned squirrel rifle. Uh Uh-huh. Know anybody around here who might own a gun like that? Yeah, but now anybody in the township. Must be three, four hundred of them rifles around. Keepsakes, handed down, family souvenirs. Yeah, then that's one dead end. Couldn't be much deader. It's like I told you, ain't no clues at all, at least none to speak of. Woman without an enemy in the world, sitting in front of her window, shot fired from outside the house, woman's dead. Them's the facts, and all the facts. No, not quite all. Eh? What do you mean? People. Persons are facts, you know. And their relations with other persons are facts. Facts that we can check on. Already told you, Mr. Dollar, Ellen Bates didn't have no enemies. The person who killed her wasn't exactly a friend. Known enemies, I mean. But she had contacts and relations with other persons, and one of them, known or unknown, was her enemy. Maybe an accidental enemy with a motive in the capacity for murder. What do you mean by accidental? Maybe Mrs. Bates saw something from that window of hers. Something that made her dangerous to someone else. Maybe she didn't even know she'd made an enemy. Yeah, might be. Or maybe it's just a matter of her death benefiting somebody. Somebody who otherwise wouldn't be her enemy. Mm Mm-hmm. It thought of that, of course. But it don't lead nowhere. It might. 
I've got a letter here, Mr. Bramler. I wish you'd take a look at it. All right. It arrived yesterday at the home office of my client in Hartford. Mm -hmm. It was mailed yeah, here in Shady Lane. I told. And close to home. Looks real close to home. <laughs> not signed, eh? No, not signed. Any idea who might have sent it? Yeah, somebody with a lot of vinegar in their blood. No, don't know. It's a fact. Wouldn't count too much on it if I was you. What do you mean? Well, like you just said, a matter of her death benefiting somebody. So? With that insurance policy like it is, the person that'd benefit most would be her husband, Ben Bates. Forget him. Why? Like you said, motive and capacity. Even if money was motive enough for Ben, he just hasn't got the capacity for murder. Forget him. Is Ben Bates a good friend of yours, Mr. Bramler? Since we were boys together. I see. Mm -hmm. Maybe you only think you see. I ain't making allowances for him. Just know him, that's all. Maybe I'd better meet him. All right. <coughs> Farm's just out of town a ways. I'll drive you out there if you want. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, only one thing, though. You, uh, you've got an expense account of some kind, ain't you? Sure, that's right. Why? Well, we're not exactly poor folks up here, but we ain't rich neither. And the township is kind of frugal with their money. I see. Going to have to charge you for the car expense if it's uh, all right with you. Oh, sure. That sounds fine. Yeah, well, then. Uh, maybe we could make a couple of other calls on the way. Who do you want to see? Well, mostly I'd like to talk to the coroner here and... You, uh, you already have. Huh? Yeah. I'm the coroner, Mr. Dollar. Well, are we ready? Expense account item two, three dollars even. Transportation and Constable Jed Bramler's car from Shady Lane to the Ben Bates farm. It was a pleasant trip. Summertime, and a country road winding among the farms, climbing lazily over the ridges. The heady, pungent scent of flax and clover, the hum of bees. But I couldn't completely enjoy it. I kept wondering how much real help I could expect from a constable who'd already made up his mind that the top suspect wasn't capable of murder. A constable who was also coroner. And for all I knew, county attorney and district judge. A constable who might even be... Just an idle thought. Might even be a murderer. Now, this is the Preeny Farm. Ben Bates' place is the next one, about a quarter of a mile. I see. That's uh, Martin Preeny there at the side of the road working on that fence. Might as well pass the time of day with him, I reckon. Were the Preenies and the Bates good friends? Yeah. Real close. Afternoon, Jed. Martin. Township must be getting lax. Letting you go gallivanting around on pleasure trips. Being paid for, Martin. Official business. This here is uh, Mr. Donnie Dollar from down around Hartford. Martin Preeny, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Preeny. I do. That's quite a job you're doing there, Mr. Preeny. Well, a rock wall does just fine if you stack them real careful so they lock together. Looks pretty difficult. Yeah, it takes a knack, no doubt about that. And work and time. But if it's dug in below the frost line, a rock wall will last a lifetime. And uh, that's what I believe in, Mr. Dollar. Planning ahead and building right. That's a good philosophy. Uh, and then, too, a rock wall is a sight cheaper than fencing. And right there is his real reason, Mr. Dollar. A man that wastes his substance is a fool and a sinner. And I believe in prudence. It's your only virtue, Martin. Fiddlesticks. We got callers, Sarah. Come on out here. No, ain't staying, Martin. Just passing. Just a minute, Martin. Just uh, what so-called official business you're on, Jed? Murder of Ellen Bates. Mr. Dollar here is an insurance investigator. He's come to look into it. I see. Well, it's a terrible tragedy, Mr. Dollar. Sad thing for the whole township, especially for Sarah and me. Yes, I imagine so. Yeah, they've been good neighbors. Fine people. Folks about to be proud to know. So I understand. Couldn't help feeling sorry for him. Just didn't seem to get ahead in spite of Ben being a good hard worker and all. And then this, on top of all the other trouble he'd had. Well, what do you mean by trouble? Afternoon, gentlemen. Come here, Sarah. Why don't you meet a friend of Jed's, Mr. Johnny Dollar, my wife, Sarah. Mr. Frenny. Mr. Dollar comes from Hartford. Hartford? But then he's here for... He works for an insurance company. He's given Jed the hand with this Ellen Bates thing. Oh, yes, I I see. Well, don't let me interrupt. I, uh, I just tell him, Mr. Dollar, what good neighbors the Bates have always been. A body couldn't ask for a better friend than Ellen Bates. Mr. Preeny, you said something about all the other trouble they'd had. No, I was referring to Ellen's illness. Why, after that operation last year, she was pretty an invalid, you might say. Yeah, Ben had to wait on her hand and foot. 
Along with doing for the house and running the farm. Huh, a lot of time he spent taking care of her. Now, Sarah. Not half as much time as he spent hanging around that girl. What girl is that, Mrs. Preenie? Why, that little flippity jibber that works at Sarah! Her. I'm sorry, Martin, but it's true and you know it. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid my wife is just repeating gossip she's heard. Ben Bates is a fine young man. Any story to the contrary, idle rumors, nothing more. Well, sometimes the best way to stop an idle rumor is to check into it. If you'd care to tell me who she is. I know the girl, Mr. Dollar. Her name is Millie Wells. She's a waitress at the Shady Lane Cafe. I'd like to talk to her. You can when we get back to town. Well, folks, reckon we'd better be getting on. Hey, Mr. Dollar, Ellen Bates was a fine woman. Whoever it was killed her. I hope you get him. I believe we will. Oh, and by the way, Mrs. Freeney, the company was very grateful for your letter. My letter? I mean, how did you know it I was... didn't know. I was just guessing. Oh. Nice to have met both of you. See you again. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, of two who are not even accused, one confesses and one denies. And both very strangely. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Carlson, Johnny, Star Mutual. Oh, hiya, Pete. How's the family? Great. The lucky dogs are at Cape Cod for the summer while I toil and fret. What's fretting you at the moment? A letter, Johnny. Listen. If you're wanting to know who murdered Ellen Bates, you pay no mind to that person or persons unknown. You just look real close to home. Look real close to home. Postmark Shady Lane, Vermont. And the signature, I suppose, is that famous old name. That's right. Anonymous. Ellen Bates was killed there a month ago, shot to death. We carried a $10,000 policy on her. And the beneficiary? Ben Bates, her husband. He's got a farm about four miles out of Shady Lane. Uh Now, what's the status of the investigation? Stalemate, Johnny. The coroner's jury brought in an open verdict, and there's been nothing turned up since. We were just on the point of paying off the policy. But now, well... All right, Pete, I'll fret for you. If I can find Shady Lane on the map. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Star Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shady Lane matter. Item one, $36.70. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Shady Lane, a quiet little town of around a thousand population. Drowsy streets lined with white frame homes, picket fences, and flower bedded yards. A town with a well chosen name. Built under the protecting shade of venerable elms and spreading maples. A country crossroads town with one of everything. One inn, one restaurant, one garage, one general store, one barber shop, and one constable. A gaunt and lantern-jawed, leather-faced man of middle age named Jed Bramler. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a fact, Mr. Dollar. Lived here all my life. First time I've ever seen it this hot. Yeah, it's warm, all right. Mm, for this time of year, at least. Weather's changing. World, too. Everything's changing. <laughs> Except human nature. Mm, that, too, maybe. Take this killing. Don't rightly know how to go about dealing with it. Well, maybe we can figure out something between us. This the bullet that killed him? Yeah, that's the one. Hmm. It's an odd size and shape. Hand poured. Say it's hand poured. It's for an old fashioned squirrel rifle. Smooth bore, single shot. I see. And I reckon that's about all I can give you in the way of facts, or clues, I guess you call them. Oh, facts will do. All right. Ellen Bates was a fine woman, had a hard life. She was married, no children, she was alive. Now she's dead. Cause of death, a bullet in the heart. Them's all facts, Mr. Dollar. Mm -hmm. How did it happen? Don't rightly know. Weren't no witnesses. Could have been an accident, even. What do you mean, an accident? Well, one of them hunters from the city. Them through here regular. Confounded idiots. Shoot at anything that moves. Well, surely not a, a human being sitting in her own living room. They might have. Never can tell. Crazy as they are. Shot a goat. Belonged to Het Wilmer last fall. Caught him with it. Tied on their bumper. Said it was a mountain sheep. Yes, but... Yes, they... might have done it unintentional. Then got scared and run out. Yes, possibly. Except for one of those facts. Which fact? This bullet. Hunters from the city don't use old-fashioned squirrel rifles, Mr. Bramler. Mm hmm Well, I said it could have been accidental. Didn't say it was, though. I, uh, I reckon somebody meant to kill her. Oh, I don't think there's much doubt of that. There ain't. Wish there was. Might not feel so danged worthless then. What do you mean? Ellen Bates was a fine woman. Hate to think of somebody killing her and getting clean away with it. Then let's make sure they don't get away with it. Got nothing to go on, Mr. Dollar. Not one lonesome thing. What about a possible motive? Haven't turned up a single one. Did she have any enemies? Everybody that knew her loved her. Uh -huh. What about this bullet? Did you have a ballistics check made? Yeah, sent it clear to New York. They come up 